<laughs> well, uh, first of all, um, I apologize for my lousy Dutch, uh, which means no Dutch at all. Uh, and I further apologize for my lousy English tonight, uh, because uh, I am still feeling the effects of jet lag, I must confess. Um, so, you know, we'll pretty much all be on par in terms of being English speakers this evening. Um, I don't think I actually need the microphone. Is it important for me? You're, you're, you're recording this? or if I, if I project this way, can you hear me properly at the back? Yeah, I could also, yeah. They are recording this? Okay, okay. So, because this microphone is taller than I am. And uh, I don't like the fact that my spikes are lower, my hair spikes are lower than this microphone. So, um, yeah, testing, good, excellent, thank you. Um, let me begin with a couple of, uh, of, well, actually three observations. First of all, um, on behalf of the people of Canada, my sincere condolences to all of you uh, for not making it further into the World Cup. Um, <laughs> But it's precisely because that very important and burning issue is now out of the way and no longer needs to be on the public agenda for this time that you know, we can move on to other important public issues like Islam and pluralism. I feel far less guilty talking about it as a result of, uh, of Netherlands being knocked out. And don't feel too badly, Canada was never in in the first place. So, um, The second more serious observation is a very hopeful one. One of the most uh, common questions that gets emailed to me through my website these days comes from young Muslim women, uh, usually but not always living in the West, uh, saying, Irshad, I have fallen in love with a non-Muslim man and my parents and their imam insist that Islam will not allow me to be with him, let alone marry him. Is this true? Uh, of course, the answer depends on your interpretation of Islam, um, but it is not necessarily true that Islam forbids interfaith relationships or interfaith marriage. And the proof of that is a handout that I've put at the back, uh, just on this table over here. So if anybody is interested in a theological defense of interfaith marriage within Islam, there are copies for you to take home. I'm not going to give you that defense right now. And very briefly, about three weeks ago, a major uh, terror plot was uncovered in my city of Toronto involving at least, possibly more, 17 Muslim men, uh, most of them young. And we know for a fact that the manipulation of religion has played a role in what brought them to the point of being busted and to the point of being shown to have three tons of ammonium nitrate, which was three times the amount of ammunition that was used to blow up the federal building in o Oklahoma City several years ago. We know that religion played a role because these young men uh, named their plot Operation Badr. B-A-D-H-R, Badr, and this refers to the Battle of Badr, which was the most decisive um, military victory achieved by the Prophet and his army in the early uh, days of Islam. And it had that much more symbolism for Muslims because according to the traditional teachings, the Prophet and his army were outmanned and outarmed by the other side. So they were operating from a well, defensive or victim's position. Um, so that this victory was a sign of God's favor upon them and gave them the energy and the momentum that they needed in order to move further with uh, military conquests in the name of Islam. 